Hi everyone. Even though I'm not an expert in electronics, I'm not an electronic engineer or anything like that, I do like to mess around with retro computing as a hobby. And as part of that, sometimes I buy these retro chips. Um, and one of these examples is this one, which is the AY38910, which is a programmable sound generator. It originally came out, I believe, in 1979, even though this chip is from apparently 1985. Um, and it's an interesting chip. It was quite common back in the day. Uh, it, uh, it was present in some arcade uh, boards, so video game arcades. You could find it in the Atari ST computer, in the ZX Spectrum, and also in the MSX computers. So what I'm going to try to do um, is interact with this chip using a, an Arduino Uno. Now, I could have used another uh, microcontroller or another board, but this I just happen to have this around, and it's quite simple, and it should do the job. So I'm going to try to do a video, sort of a step-by-step -step explaining how this works, how the chip works itself, and how we can use it using the Arduino. So yeah, let's start. I'm going to start by looking at the datasheet. So I've downloaded the datasheet for the AY38910. Uh, and we can see here that this datasheet talks about three chips, including uh, the one I'm using. So these are actually just variants of each other. And uh, they're quite quite the same in terms of sound capabilities there is there's actually no difference there are also other clones and variants out there i can remember the the one the ym 2149 made by yamaha but there are also others uh scrolling down looking at the features here we can see it talks about three uh independent analog outputs and if we look at the pinout here on the right we can see them right in here so this means that the chip has three sound channels or it can produce sound in three independent channels and each one of them has their own dedicated physical pin so if we want to use them together or if we want all the channels uh and connect them to a speaker for example we would have to mix them on the on the outside with some sort of circuitry now it also talks about some general purpose io ports and basically uh, what this means is this has an extra feature or a bonus feature where a CPU that would interface with this chip would be able to have access to I.O. ports. So this has nothing to do with sound generation and this is just to make the sound chip a little bit more, more versatile and give it more capabilities that would be interesting in the system back then. Uh, I won't be using this this feature, the general purpose I.O. ports. So let's scroll down and try to look at the sound generation and what kind of capabilities it has. So looking at the sound generating blocks, we can see that the chip has uh, tone generators. So basically the main way this chip produces sound is through square waves which in which we can change the frequency. So each one of the channels can have can produce tones in different frequencies and is only able to produce square waves nothing more there's also one one noise generator and this noise generator is basically a square wave um, with a pseudo random pulse width which means that basically it's producing just noise and you would use this noise to mimic uh, percussion instruments for example or to have sound effects like explosions or punches uh, that's why uh, that's uh, where this noise would be used back then then of course it says that it can mix both the tone generators and the single noise generators so basically you can choose uh, if your channels would uh, output tone noise or both it also has amplitude control, so we could change the volume for each of the channel. And it has an envelope generator, which means it can uh, have a pattern change the way the amplitude uh, changes over time for the channels. 
And then it talks about, in the end, that the signal is converted from digital to analog, so it's a digital to analog converter, and it only has 16 levels, which means it's 4-bit sound. Now, in order for us to understand how we uh, actually control this, we go up a little bit, look at architecture, and we see that it talks about 16 memory mapped registers. So basically, this chip has an internal state. And then the internal state can be manipulated by changing the values of 16 registers. So these 16 registers are basically 16 bytes uh, of memory inside the chip. And, it, and by changing the values, we're actually changing the way the sound is produced. Or we're changing certain variables in those generators and controllers that I mentioned. So to better understand this, scrolling down, we find this block diagram which is actually quite useful. So this shows us uh, functional blocks of the chip and the way they connect to pins. And we can see here on top and other pins here on the bottom. And we can have a look here at this table, which mentions the registers. So we have here the 16 registers. Uh, I just have to mention that uh, this number here is not actually base 10, is actually base 8. So you can see here it jumps from R7 to R10, but actually 10 in octal or base 8 means 8. And this is important because let's say you want to change the value of this register, it's not actually 12, it's actually 10. So it would be at address 10. So here we have the list of the 16 registers. And we're going to have a look at this list later on to see how we can manipulate sound, how we can produce sound. So for example, register 7, we can configure uh, the channels to produce noise, tone, or both. And we have other registers that uh, change the period or the frequency of the tone, the frequency of the noise, the the configure the amplitude envelope and of course control the volume and this is basically how the chip works and its capabilities and now that we know the capabilities of this chip and how it works we can have a look at its pins the inputs outputs and how we're going to connect them Looking into the data sheet again, we have the pin out here in the first page. And let's exclude all the pins that we're not actually going to need for this project. So none of the I.O. pins or the general purpose I.O. port pins are going to be needed. So we don't need these. Also, we don't need the non-connected uh, pins and we don't need the test pins. Every other pin we have left, we're going to need to connect it somewhere. And I think we're going to start with the clock input. And scrolling down, we find here a description of the clock. So it says it's a time reference for the tone, noise, and envelope generators. So basically, whatever uh, clock you give to this chip, it's going to influence these generators. And if we scroll all the way down into electrical characteristics, we find that our clock here uh, needs to have a frequency between 1 and 2 megahertz. So it doesn't specify um, a typical frequency, it only says that it needs to be between 1 and 2. Now I'm going to choose 2 megahertz just because every, every project I've seen online uses 2 megahertz, so I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to use this frequency. So in order to generate this clock signal that we need to feed the chip, we could use an external component such as, such as an active crystal oscillator. We could also use a passive crystal oscillator with some other chips, but we are going to use the Arduino Uno because we're already going to use the Arduino Uno. And it, it is possible to create a clock signal out of one of the timers in the Arduino. So what I've done here is I've set some registers in the Arduino and this will activate timer one, set it into a mode uh, that will output a signal into pin nine and also disable the prescaler. And 
as I set it right here, it will output a signal which varies from high to low and will repeat itself uh, 8 million times a, se a second. So basically, this will generate an 8 megahertz clock signal in pin, on, pin 9. But since we want a 2 megahertz clock signal, we need to divide this. So if I just put a number 3 in here, this will divide the 8 megahertz clock by whatever number I put in here plus 1. So this will divide it by 4 and we get our 2 megahertz clock signal on pin 9. Let's just check the clock signal on the Arduino. So we can connect a few wires here. One to pin 9 and another one to ground. Any ground will do. And now I can use a multimeter. I could also have used an oscilloscope. It's just that a multimeter is easier. And I'm just going to use some alligator clips. Now let me power the Arduino. Right, and set this to frequency. And there you go, two megahertz. Let's now look at the other pins. So aside from the clock, we have all these other pins that we need to check out. Uh, one of them is the reset. So the reset pin um, obviously resets the internal state of the chip. Now, we don't exactly need to use this but I am going to use it anyway, and I'm going to reset the chip uh, every time we initialize the Arduino. Then, after the reset, we have two different types of pins. We have these three right here, bus control 1, bus control 2, and bus direction, which are control pins. And then we have the other pins, which are related to data and address bus, which are all these ones plus these two over here now the way these pins work is explained here so by changing the values of bus control 1 bus control 2 and bus direction we essentially change the function or the mode of the chip the chip itself has four different modes either it's inactive latching an address which means setting an internal register reading from that uh, register that was set, reading the value, or writing a value to that register. So these are the four possible states or possible modes of the sound chip. Now, the reason they use three uh, control pins is because these three control pins also exist in other CPUs, such as the CP1610. Now, this CPU was made by General Instrument, which is the same manufacturer as this chip. So, obviously, they made this chip fully compatible with these processors. But we're not actually interested in interfacing with this processor. So, they made a simplified version where BC2 can be connected to VCC. So, a value of 1 could be fed to BC2. And then all we need to do is change the values of BDIR and BC1 to change the functions of the chip. So what this means essentially is that BC2, actually we don't need to connect to the Arduino, we just need to connect the VCC, and then we only need to connect these other two pins. These pins here, uh, DA0 up to DA7 together with A8 and A9, form the data and address bus. So they act as a data bus when we're setting a value or when we're reading a value from a register and they act as an address bus when its internal mode is to latch an address or to set the internal register. That's basically what it means. So this, these all these pins act together as a bus to get either the register number or the value to save. And then there's these extra A8 and A9 for the address of the registers, which aren't really necessary. And what it says here is that we can tie these A9 and A8 to a larger address bus. And it will basically ignore this chip if the A9 and A8 are not 0 and 1. So we don't actually need that in our project. 
And when we don't need this, we can leave the pins alone because they have internal resistors. Or it says here that in case of noisy environments, we can tie one to ground and tie the other one to 5V. So we're gonna tie them down to ground in 5V just to make sure. So we don't need to connect them to the Arduino. Um, and we're just gonna connect all of these here. Let's pick our pins in the Arduino. So we have here the Arduino pinout right next to our chip pinout. So to connect reset, I'm gonna connect it here to pin eight. Uh, pin nine is occupied with the clock and we've already seen that some pins have specific functions in the Arduino. So it's always uh, a good thing to check uh, if we're gonna use any of the special functions in the Arduino. In this case, uh, in the future, I'm gonna use the SPI protocol. So I'm not gonna use any of these pins here, but I can use all others. So for the data and address bus, zero to seven, I'm gonna use them all together. And I'm going to use all these pins here because together these form a port and I can manipulate them all at once. Now I'm using pin, pin 0 and 1 which are used for serial communication. But I'm not going to use serial communication in this project so it's fine. If you want to use serial communication then avoid using these pins here. And now all I'm missing is B there and BC1. And I'm going to use A4 and A5 for that. So we are going to make the connections between the Arduino and the AY38910. So yeah, the first thing we have to do, uh, or the, well, we actually can do this in any order, but I think the logical thing to do first is connect the ground. There goes the ground, minus the minus, and the VCC, and we're going to use 5 volts, and use the 3.3, use the 5 volts, because this is the 5 volt chip. Uh, we can put that to plus in here. Now it's also a good idea to power both rails just because we might need both rails and I think we are going to need both rails so we're going to just hook up plus or plus and minus with minus right here. Now, I'm sorry for the colors. Of course, this is going to work anyways, but uh, just don't forget plus with plus and minus with minus. Don't get that confused. You'll probably create a short, which is not good. Okay, so now we can hook up the chip to power. And this pin right here goes to VCC. So VCC. All right, I can hook it up right there. It's a little bit ugly, but who cares? And this one right here, the first one, the one, pin one, goes to ground. All right. Okay. So we can now start hooking up everything else. So we know that our clock input is pin nine, pin nine. And we know that our clock input is this pin right here, one before the last. Um, then the one above, we know it's the reset pin. Now the reset um, has a pull-up resistor, like I said before, an internal pull-up, so we could just leave it unconnected, but we want to control it, we want to reset it, so we're going to do it. But it's completely optional. Um, so, yeah, right. Now we have the A9 and the A8 pins, and for the A9, we're going to have to connect it to ground. There we go. And the A8 is going to be connected to VCC. Let's not get that wrong. All right. It's a bit harder to do when you have the, the camera in front of you. Um, then we have a pin which we don't want to use, which is a test pin. That's fine. And then we have B there. Now B there, we said it was going to be a four. That's fine. So four it is. All right. And then we have B C two, which we saw we can always leave it high. So we're going to connect it to high. All right. Here we go gonna work and now we have B3 
AC1, which we wanted to connect to A5. So A5 goes to BC1. Here we go. All right. Then after that, we have our data or data lines, data slash address lines. We have seven of them. It starts in DA7 and goes all the way up to DA0. And we here have in the Arduino the pins 7 to 0. So that's why I've uh, oriented the Arduino like this because it's easier. 7 to 7, 6 to 6, etc. until we get to 0. All right, here we go, all connected. Now all we need to do is connect the output pins to our headphones or our speakers. On some sound chips, you need to connect these pins to an op amp or some external amplifying circuit before you connect to headphones or speakers to amplify its signal. But in this chip, it's not absolutely necessary. So if you connect it directly, you will hear some sound. Uh, however, I am going to use some circuitry with resistors and capacitors to filter a little bit of sound as it sounds a little bit better, I think. Let's look at that circuit. So I'm going to use some resistors and some capacitors that are going to help me filter the sound a little bit before I connect it to my speakers. Here I'm going to use a brake board, which has a 3.5 millimeter jack socket which makes it easier for me to use a 3.5 millimeter jack to connect uh, anything I want to my sound chip. So the way jacks work is they have several segments. So if you ever looked at the 3.5 millimeter jack, they have several segments. So when we're looking at audio, uh, the tip will be the audio signal and then the rest of it will be ground. And when we have stereo audio, which is actually the most common type, you'll have a tip, a ring and a sleeve, which corresponds to the left side, the right side audio and then ground. And then you can have four segments when you have, for example, a microphone, but also when you have uh, a 3.5 millimeter jack that carries video, for example, you can have four segments. So in our case, we're basically going to interact with either a two or a three segment if we have some stereo speakers, which we usually do. So ring two is not going to do us any good. It's going to be the same as sleeve in this case. So tip is going to be left and ring one is going to be right. If we connect it like this, we will only have sound from the left side. If we make the same exact connection to tip and ring one, we'll have basically the same audio coming out of the left and the right side. For the circuit one I'm going to use, so I saw this online and I tested it and it works out, so I'm going to use it. I'm going to use uh, three 10k ohm uh, resistors, so 10,000 ohm. So the three of them are connected together, and I'm going to use a pull down resistor, in this case, a 3.3k ohm, so 3300 ohm resistor and I'm going to pull it down so I'm going to connect it to ground there you go now I'm going to use stick it right here in the middle and I'm going to use the resulting signal and I'm going to hook it up to a capacitor so this is a 10 nanofarad capacitor it says 103 in there. I don't know if it's visible, but this is a ceramic capacitor and we're going to connect to the signal and to ground. It's a tiny, tiny capacitor. All right. And then to connect our signal to either the tip or one of the rings, I'm going to use an electrolyt electrolytic capacitor. So this is a 10 microfarad uh, electrolytic capacitor. Now remember that these capacitors are actually polar, which means that size are different. There's a longer leg and there's a shorter leg and the shorter leg has a minus in it. So we want the minus, the short leg on the output here. And the other leg is gonna hook it up 
here into the signal. And now all we need to do is connect the sleeve to ground. And we're going to connect it on this side that we have room to connect the jack in here. And there we go. Yeah, there it is. We can now continue with our Arduino code. So what I'm going to do here first is set some constants with the pins we chose. Now we're going to set these pins as outputs. And now we're also going to set uh, all the pins from 0 to 7 as outputs. And this I can do all at once because they're part of the same port, port D. And I can also set them all to output uh, 0. And since we have the reset pin, we can reset the chip. And there you go. So I'm sending a low value to the reset pin, then waiting a bit, then setting it to high again, and this will effectively reset the sound chip. And we're ready to set the values of the registers in the sound chip. So let's understand a little bit better how we're gonna do that. Going back to the data sheet, so we have two control pins which we can change their values, which is BC1 and B there. BC2 is going to be constantly high. And if we scroll down and we look at this uh, table over here, so BC2 doesn't really matter. And we basically need to set the functions of the sound chip to write to PSG, this will write a value, and to latch address, which will mean set a register, and also inactive, because it will also be useful. So let's, let's write the functions in which we're gonna set the chip to these three functions or these three modes. Now that we have the functions to change the function or the mode of the chip, we can actually write our function that sets a value to a register. So let's do that. Now, by combining our functions that we wrote before, we're able to write a value to a register. So by manipulating the control pins, we're able to set the sound chip to mode latch. And that means that whatever is in the address bus will be the register, the active register to which we can write values or read values from. So we set it to mode, to mode latch, and then we set the register, we put it into the data or address bus. Then uh, we set the chip to inactive. So whenever we're changing the function of the chip, it's better to set it to inactive, to interleave it with an inactive function. Then we set it to write. So now he's going to write to whatever register we set before that is latched. And we're going to put the value into the data or the address bus. And then we're going to set it to inactive to finish so that whenever we're, we're finished with the, the chip, we better set it to inactive so that nothing happens and no value is saved by accident into it. We now have everything we need to set values into registers in our sound chip, so let's just do that. As a simple example, I'm only going to use channel A and the tone generator. So let's see what kind of registers we need to change. Looking at our data sheet, of course, we can scroll down and looking at this table, we can see that we need to change the values uh, for register 7 and for R10, which is actually register 8. So register 7 uh, is going to be useful to for us to enable channel A with the tone generator and disable everything else. So because it's written like this, this means that it's active low. So I'm going to need to set A to 0. So this 
first bit is going to be zero then these are going to be one and these are also going to be one since i'm not going to use noise and then these don't really matter because it's the general purpose io ports and i'm not going to use then i'm going to set the volume of channel a to its maximum so register eight is actually going to have one in all these bits which is the maximum volume uh, level 15 and m is going to be zero because i want to use this volume and i don't want to use the envelope okay now we've enabled channel a and we've also set its volume to the maximum amplitude let me just set the mode of the chip to inactive here at the start and also let me just do a correction here it's not dear but pin and we're ready to set the frequency or the period of the tones for the channel a so that we can listen to some some sounds so let's have a look at the data sheet again so what we need to do now is set the values for register 0 and register 1 because they're going to uh, set channel a's period so the way this works is that register 0 has 8-bit fine tune and register 1 has a 4-bit coarse tune What this means, and it's explained right here, is that the register 1 together with register 0 will form a 12-bit tone period. So basically, we have a 12-bit number, which is broken down into 8-bit and 4-bit. Now, how do we know the period of certain tones? How do we know which values to put? So for that, I'm going to bring up the most useful tool known to men which is the spreadsheet, of course. And I'm going to set some notes starting with middle C. OK, and now I'm going to get the frequencies for these notes. Right, so I've downloaded these frequencies uh, from the Internet, of course. And now let's try to figure out how we can get the period. If we go to the data sheet, we can see that it takes the frequency of the input clock, then it counts to 16, and then it counts further by this period that we set here. So basically what this means is we have the 2 megahertz clock, and we divide it by 16, then dividing by this period we get this frequency. If we turn this around, this means if we divide this by the frequency, we get the period. And here we go. Let me just round this number so that we get an integer. And now we have the period for each one of these notes. From here, we can turn this period into a binary number. Here we go. And now all we need to do is get these four bits and get these eight bits. So, and one goes to register zero and the other one goes to register one. So the eight bits here go to register zero. And then we get these four bits here and they go to register one. And here we go. Now we have the values that we have to set for register 0 and 1 relating these notes. Let's test setting these tones. So I'm going to grab these values here. And here in the loop, I'm going to write them to the registers.
And here we are changing the value of the tone period for channel A. I've added a half a second delay every time I change the value, so we should hear a different tone every half a second. I have just programmed the Arduino. Let me just connect uh, some externally powered speakers I have here. And let's power it up and see what happens. All right, as we can hear, uh, there is a tone being generated. So we've successfully activated the tone generator to channel A. We've set its volume to maximum and we're changing its period every half a second. Now we have our chip producing sound. We have the Arduino interacting uh, with it the way we want to, but it's not producing some impressive sound. Uh, we're only using one channel. We're only using the tone generator. So I thought to show the chip's true capabilities that we step up the game a little bit. And for that, um, I thought about putting a file into an SD card, interfacing the SD card with the Arduino, and then that file would have information for a song that we would be able to play on this chip. Online, we can find many files of many different file formats of sound information for this particular sound chip. One of such file formats is the YM file format. Now this audio format logs instructions sent to a sound chip. What this means is, uh, this has a list of information of registers and values. Because when you think about it, a song is just knowing which value is going to be set to which register at a particular time. And that's all there is to it. Even though this file format is relatively simple, I still feel it's a little bit complex for the processing power of the Arduino. Uh, furthermore, sometimes it's compressed, which is not good. And for that reason, I've created a Python script. What this Python script does is convert uncompressed YM files into a file format I came up with called SNG. Now this new file format will store lists of registers and values to be set to those registers that need to be set every frame. Back in the day um, when this chip was still around and being produced, the AY38910, uh, CPUs would typically update uh, sound, video, and logic every frame. And usually every frame meant uh, every time the picture needed to be updated, which meant usually 60 times a second or 50 times a second if it was NTSC or PAL if you were connected to a TV. So this is the way that music and songs are usually stored in these formats. And this is the exact same way I'm going to store in this, in this new file format. So here we have an example uh, in text form of how a resulting file will be. The resulting file will be in binary, but I have it in text form so we can read. And the first five bytes are fixed, SNG10, so the version and what the file format is. I like to put a header on uh, every file format, even though I might not check it. And then the resulting bytes will be pairs of bytes, where the first byte is a register and the second is a value. So this would mean set value 10 to register 7, set value 100 to register 0, and so forth. Now, when we reach a register, which is register 16, the sound chip does not have a register 16, it only has registers from zero to 15. So 16 actually has a special meaning and it means wait zero frames. So it'll skip to the next frame and only when it gets there, so it wait a few milliseconds and then it will set these values. And then there's another register 16 and this means wait two frames and then uh, it will set more registers and then it has another special register which is 255 which means end of file and this is a fairly simple example of a file in this file format let's now go back to our arduino code and make some changes
So we want to open a file from the SD card, read its contents continuously, and stream it to the sound chip. So the first thing we can do is include the SD card library. We're going to need to choose a pin to be the SD card select pin. So I'm going to write uh, a constant here. Uh, and I'm going to choose uh, pin 10. Now we can uh, actually initialize the SD card uh, interface. And we can clear just everything we're not going to need. So we're not going to need to write any specific values to any specific registers. We'll let the song do that. So I'm going to clear everything here. And we can start writing our code to open the file and read it. So here in the loop function, I'm just going to open uh, a file and I'm just going to keep reading it continuously. And when the file uh, ends, I'm going to open it again. So the first thing up after opening the file is we read the header. Now, I'm not going to check the header, but we need to read the five bytes. And now we're ready to read the contents uh, of the file. Okay, and here we have the uh, the code that will continuously read the contents of the file. So the pairs register value. And if the register is less than 16, then it's going to write to the sound chip. If the register is register 16, then it's going to put a delay of 20 milliseconds times whatever value it is. And now the only thing left to do is put a file into the SD card. So I need a file uh, with this name because this is the only file the, this program is going to read. So let me go to my YM uh, file converter and just convert uh, one file that I got online. Here we go. It's a song from the game 1943 by Jason Brook, I believe. And now just copy the output. To my SD card. I'm going to use an SD card module that I have here, which is 5e compatible, so it's compatible with the Arduino One. Let's look at its pins. It has a chip select, that input, clock, and that output. So now we need to connect it to the Arduino. So the chip select is going to go to pin 10. This is the pin we chose as being the slave select or chip select. The data input is going to be connected into the MOSI pin, which is pin 11, which is uh, master out slave in. And we need to connect to pin 12, the data output, which is master in slave out. And then we need the clock, which goes to pin 13. That's the SPI clock. And now we need to connect the ground and VCC. Okay, so I already have the SD card in here. Let's check it out and power the Arduino. Okay, and we have the theme from the video game 1943 for the Atari ST. So I'm pretty happy with this, uh, even though it's fairly simple. Uh, we could make it a little bit more complex. We could add more song files in here, change the program for that. Uh, we could also add an LCD, maybe some buttons and turn this into a standalone uh, sound player. That would be cool. I'm not gonna do that, but that would be cool and that would be fairly simple to do. But for me, this is it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video and see you guys around.